with that, today we're going to talk about the solder pasting process. And I know what you're thinking, how exciting can solder be? But when you get down to it, it's what holds our boards together. Without solder, your components and your board would never properly mate and they would never stay together. So there's a lot of science involved in that. With that, I brought in two industry experts, Shane Shuffield and Sebastian Weber. Shane, as we mentioned, already has 15 years of industry experience. And Sebastian, how many do you have? Uh, 10 years. 10 years. Okay, so together, man, we're looking at a quarter century of, of knowledge. As we go through this, you're going to have the opportunity to ask these gentlemen questions. Down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. Please use that to ask questions as we go through. Please do not use chat as it will not be monitored. Let's learn a little bit about you guys. Shane, tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so, uh, so my name is Shane. I'm the Executive Vi Vice President of Sales here um, at Advanced Assembly, and um, and as Mark said, I've I've got um, about 15 years experience in uh, PCB um, assembly and electronic manufacturing. Um, one of the things that I get to do, and 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 I'm really blessed to be able to do it. I travel um, around the country um, regularly. Um, obviously, not right now. This is about the extent of my 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 um, traveling is is using Zoom, um, <laughs> but I do get to travel around the country and, and meet a lot of of engineers and customers just like you guys and um and, and i really i really get to learn uh, about multiple industries um the the way that the boards are are designed um processes and procedures that that so many different companies use and um and i really enjoy it i thoroughly enjoy it i've done so many things uh, when i joined advanced assembly uh, back in 2006 there were 12 employees and um, and we had um, like we were we were we were lucky to ship a, a, a design or two a week, and now uh, 15 years later, um, it's just amazing to to be a part of such an, um, a, a fast growing company um, and a great industry. Um, but one of the things that I get to hear when I'm out is um, I hear customers' interest levels of different aspects of the assembly process, and this one that we're talking about today is one that I that I absolutely love um, because we, as Sebastian is gonna go over in a few minutes, we have tried to stay on the cutting edge of technology for you, the customer. We've invested a lot into it. So we'll talk about a little bit of science and then we're gonna talk about some, some really cool equipment. Um, and, um, and it's just stuff that customers like you guys um, tell me that they're interested in all the time. So really looking forward to uh, sharing that with you. Um, on a personal note, I'm in Colorado, been here um, since about 2002, and uh, I love climbing mountains. It's kind of my my outside of work hobby. Um, but that's it for me, and really glad that you guys are joining us today. Thanks, Shane. Sebastian, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm a process engineer at Advanced Assembly. I've been uh, with Advanced Assembly for about five years. Um, prior to that, I also have five years of kind of doing some prototype cabling. Uh, so a little bit of different of an industry, but relatively the same. It's it's all production. Um, and so my main focus, uh, is basically observing and solving, uh, design issues, uh, that show their ugly faces out during the production, uh, of a board. So a lot of, uh, a lot of what I do is, uh, provide feedback to customers on how to improve manufacturability, um, how to decrease the cost, um, just general, um, design implementations that can make life a whole lot easier for everyone. Um, and then I also do a lot of the uh, equipment validation. So we'll bring in equipment, we'll evaluate it. Um, as Shane mentioned, we're trying to stay on the bleeding edge. So we're always looking at what is new and what's coming out and whether or not it fits uh, a need for, for what we do here. Um, and that's basically, basically what I do. All right. Well, that sounds exciting. So together, you guys have 25 years. And if you add in all my experience, that brings us up to 25 and a half years. So, I mean, <laughs> we got something. We got something. That's what you just right. say, a little So today I was hoping. I thought you were going to away from us, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Shane, that's an excellent, excellent point. I probably do, but. <laughs> All right, so today I was hoping we could talk about stencil and solder physics. Um, maybe some opportunities for failure to design and look at some mitigation factors. So with that, Sebastian, 
can you tell me a little bit about solder? I mean, what do you know? Yeah, so I mean, um, solder is basically, you had mentioned it earlier, and it's, it's a really good way to describe it. It's the glue that holds everything together on a board. So you have all of these different components uh, for a design. You have your ICs, you have res your resistors, your caps, the PCB itself, um, and you have to have a way to bond all of that together um, to make an electrical connection. Um, you guys can see on the screen, there's a textbook definition of what it is, but uh, basically if you have a board and something is not working on it, there is a really high chance that uh, solder is one of the reasons why it may be failing. So, and that's, that's kind of the big reason why making sure you understand the solder process, how, uh, how, how the different ways of soldering affect the assembly and so on and so forth is just really important from a manufacturing and from a design standpoint. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, dig into this, shall we? Yeah. All right. Um, so solder paste. Yes. So uh, yeah, so solder comes in a bunch of different forms. Um, obviously, one of the most common forms is solder paste. And solder paste is basically uh, it's a mixture of uh, solder alloy, basically a metal alloy and flux. Um, and the way I always describe it is it's basically like a Wendy's Frosty. It's not a solid and it's not a liquid. It's, it's a sockwood um, with the consistency of like peanut butter. Uh, and basically what you do is you, you take this paste um, with all this solder alloys and you paste it onto your board and then you throw parts down and then you throw it into a, uh, glorified pizza oven, melt everything together, and then uh, basically call it good. Uh, uh, Sebastian, you're using a lot of food references. You're, please tell me you're not eating this stuff, buddy. It's, it is 12 o'clock right now. I'm just saying. Oh, that's, that's fair enough. Okay, so why do we have different sizes of um, solder paste, solder balls? Yeah, so there's actually a couple different reasons. Obviously, um, it depends. If you have smaller pads, for example, you're going to want to use a smaller size uh, paste just because that's gonna allow for uh, like a better coverage and a better wetting. And depending on how you're applying your paste, um, it can greatly affect uh, how well it's actually applied. Um, so for example, if you have some of these larger like type three solder paste balls versus a type five solder paste ball, and you're trying to paste like an 0201, uh, an 0402 or something like that, uh, depending on how large the hole is in a stencil or um, whatever method you're using to paste, uh, that solder may not release onto the board correctly, which could result in a bunch of opens. It could result in insufficient solder. Um, it could result in a connection that's really weak and could break later from just normal vibration. Um, so there's a lot of different things that kind of go into it. Um, and, and the types of solder balls that are in the paste is just one factor. There's a lot of other factors um, such as the type of flux that's used. Um, like there's no clean, there's uh, water soluble, um, there's ones with halides, there's ones with all kinds of different uh, properties that'll just kind of change how uh, the end product behaves. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Like when would I choose a no clean versus, uh, you know, a different type of flux? Yeah, so I, I think it really just depends on what your design is. If you have a really basic design, it's, it's going you know, going into a toaster, um, then you probably really don't care what's used as long as it's built correctly. Uh, but if you have, uh, for example, like sensors um, or something that has a risk for damage during like a wash process uh, or something like that, you'll probably want to use uh, like a no clean flux that's uh, not active after uh, the reflow process so that it doesn't cause any sort of degradation uh, afterwards. Uh, versus like a water soluble flux, which is basically flux is acidic and water soluble fluxes are more acidic. And over time, they can actually corrode and eat away your board if they're not properly cleaned off. All right. So I've also heard that you can't really store this stuff on hand for too long. What happens there? Do you know? Yeah. So obviously with water soluble fluxes, you have a flux that is water based um, and moisture in the air. Um, combined with the paste, it will slowly leach away all of your moisture and you end up with a, a dried clump of basically solder balls. Um, and it's not pretty, it doesn't work very well, and it definitely does not reflow well. Uh, oh. So it's very important that you 
kind of follow the manufacturer recommendations, store it in a fridge, keep it in an airtight container, um, so on and so forth. And that's kind of one of the advantages even with uh, no clean flux is it has a much longer shelf life. Um, it has a much uh, lower risk of degrading over time as compared to like water soluble. We don't carry this stuff on hand though. We just kind of keep it going through our system. We don't keep this sitting around for a month, do we? Oh no, we, we physically can't. It's, it's almost an issue because we need to keep ordering more and uh, sometimes it's just hard to get it in uh, just depending on the stock of our suppliers, especially during this time. Uh, well, with COVID and everything, luckily we haven't run into any issues and we've got a pretty good stockpile, but yeah, definitely something, uh, something to consider if you're keeping paste on hand for a long time, or if you're not consistently using it very often. All right. So just keep around as much as you need to use. All yeah, right. Exactly. All right. So production and old school, what are stencils? Yeah. So stencils are kind of like the old school technology. Um, and you can kind of see in that top left corner, uh, it's basically just a big sheet of uh, steel and they cut out these holes in it. And then you take that stencil and your PCB and you line it up and then you take a squeegee and your paste and you squeegee your paste onto the board. And you can kind of see that in the top right section. Oh yeah, that's a good picture too. Um, and then when you lift that stencil up, all of the paste um, inside of those holes if you're lucky and if you chose the, the right type of solder and you have the right size apertures, um, we'll release that solder paste onto your board. Um, at which point then you can go to uh, your pick and place machines and you can start you know, throwing parts onto your board and, and get that ready for reflow. All right. So you would sit there and do something like this? Yeah, uh, so this is definitely some of the more old school um, technology. Um, and we actually still have some of these at our location just for random one-off applications. There's still good uses for it. And the, the process has been, you know, it's, it's very robust. It's, um, there are obviously pluses and minuses to everything, but uh, that's basically what you do is you just glob on some paste, get a squeegee, um, and just squeeze it all onto the board and hope that you are pretty consistent with your pressure. All right, now when you start using machines to run the squeegees, um, do you do the boards drop down? Do the do the stencils lift up? How does that work? Yeah, so and uh, you can kind of see in this picture uh, on the right side, um, there's a large frame uh, below, and then you have the board mounted, and then on the top you can see is uh, kind of like a little uh, clamshell uh, top cover. Um, and that's where the stencil actually sits. You can see the, the white circles of the board and they would take that clamshell top and uh, close the lid. And then that kind of gives you your, uh, your flush uh, surface with the board. Then you would Isn't, apply the paste like in the, the left picture. Wouldn't it be kind of hard to keep everything aligned? Yes, it can be extremely difficult. Uh, this process is extremely manual. Um, and there's definitely better setups. Um, like I said, technology has definitely gotten better with this. People can create jigs um, and all kinds of other stuff. Um, and then there's also the automated stencil process, which is like the next step up from that, um, where they start trying to control more of the positioning of the board, um, how much pressure is being placed, uh, how much paste is actually going down, and of course the speed of it and everything else. And all of these are different factors that go into the stencil process that can change um, almost the entire uh, success of the board. Um, these are very important because once again, if you don't have a good process for applying solder, you will not have a good process for manufacturing your board and it will not, uh, it just, your board won't work as well as it's supposed to. So Shane, back in the early days, you had to do this, right? After like you do your sales call, you, didn't you have to go back to the uh, factory floor and, and run a couple of stencils? Yeah, you know, when, that's, when, when, we, when we started um, and, and really for the first probably 12 years, uh, we used the manual solder paste approach, which was just a slide earlier. And um, yeah, and so we, we, were all, we were all taught how to do it, um, the proper way to go back and and um, you know, we, we, we had to, because we would handle a lot of, of single boards, individual boards, um, we had to kind of come up with a, with a way to, to, to get this done. One thing I'd like to add really right here is, you know, at that time, 
Mark, we we didn't place components that were smaller than 0603s. And, and that was one of the reasons that we got away with using, um, using that uh, more manual approach for so long. Um, probably as, as I as just dated um, that process as I said it, um, because I guarantee you um, the majority of boards that folks are working on today, um, at the very least, uh, they go down to 0402s, if not 0201s, if not 0105s, micro BGAs. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, but absolutely, we, we uh, were taught here, you know, we sell a little bit and you go back and you did whatever you could in the back. And this was, I guess this was one of the um, responsibilities that I qualified for uh, in the early days. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of problems with using stencils, aren't there? Just like... Well, yeah, there's a ton, yeah, there's a ton. And, and, you know, as, as um, Sebastian was just talking, you know, I, I always focus on the one biggest issue and that one biggest issue is there can be a ton of issues. That's really the biggest one. No matter what the issue is, you're generally left with having to order a new stencil. Um, and, and that's, that's the biggest issue. We got, you know, delays or, or I think we've been, uh, Sebastian was talking about the apertures. Um, if the aperture is the wrong size, the wrong amount of paste on the board, yeah, we could probably get by with, with making a board for you, but it's certainly not repeatable and it's certainly not something that is as, as reliable. Um, and so in that case, you're looking at, at generally a delay or um, you know, extended um, delivery time because you're gonna have to wait uh, for a new stencil to be cut and shipped. And so that's probably the biggest issue, but Sebastian, you wanna share some of the other issues that, that kind of led us to making some of the decisions that we made? Yeah, and I just want to point out the picture on this slide too. So you look at that top right, um, you can actually see kind of uh, an example of just horrible uh, paste application. So you can see uh, those two leads that are uh, the mouse is pointing at basically have no solder. Um, it might make an electrical connection, but if that board gets bumped or vibrated in some way, it could very easily lose connection and then uh, uh, just cease to function. Uh, so once again, it, the solder process is extremely important and uh, stencils, uh, while they've been around in the industry and it's definitely a, a proven process, they do have their limitations. And uh, like Shane was saying, all of those limitations um, can add up and almost always if there's a failure in the stencil process, it means you have to get a whole new stencil. You have to add more turn time. You have to add more cost. Um, and all of that just adds up in the long end, um, so let's making take a look it design at, unmanufacturable. Let's take a, a look at a couple of those those problems. Yeah, so yeah. definitely incorrect aperture sizes. Um, so for example, if you don't have your paste file, uh, your Gerbers and everything else, if those are not set up correctly, um, then whenever that stencil is ordered, if it's an inexperienced board house or a fab house, uh, uh, that's making that stencil, they could definitely create something that's going to cause problems. And you kind of see on the bottom here, the violation of the aspect ratio, that stencil is way too thick. And what happens is uh, the paste will want to stick to the stencil more than it wants to stick to the board. So you end up with insufficient solders. And a lot of times this can really just change depending on the size of the aperture. So if you have, you know, a lot of really small components, it's very important that uh, either you understand the, the pace process or that your assembly house uh, has a really robust way of ordering stencils and getting the, the right stencil for what you need. Oh, huh. what a pain, I tell you. What, and um, I'm just gonna throw on that one too. The, uh, like for example, if you were to order through us, we'll pretty much always tell our customers to make your paste apertures uh, a one-to-one -one ratio with the uh, with uh, uh, your pads. Got it, okay. But we use a different process now that we'll get to here in a second. Correct. Another issue here, it looks like they missed a hole or it didn't etch all the way through, correct? Yep, so uh, this could be anywhere from, uh, it's missing on a customer's paste file, um, it could have been an error on the fab side when they were making the stencil. Um, but I mean, the bottom line is uh, someone's going to either have to manually add paste every time, which is, uh, it's going to take more time to do. Um, there's higher risk for someone putting too little or too much paste. Um, so it's not very repeatable, which is very key in our industry. Um, or you have to order a new stencil and that's an additional cost, an additional turn time, and uh, probably some, some upset people. 
Yeah, of course. All right. What are we looking at here, Sebastian? Yeah, so um, one of the other issues, uh, obviously, as designs uh, go on and on and on, everything is getting smaller. Um, everything is getting closer together. And when you have higher density and you have only a small amount of real estate to put everything on, um, you start to run into more risks with the stencil process. Um, if you can get your stencil to lay perfectly flat against your board, um, you don't have these types of these types of issues. But most of the time, because it is a manual process and there is some form of uh, trickery always going on 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 uh, design, uh, you'll get some sort of lift just because of how close those holes are in the stencil, and there will be bend as pressure is applied. And you can see it on this picture. Ideally, that top picture looks. Uh, is in a perfect world. However, in the realistic world, that middle picture is usually what happens. As pressure is applied, um, you can see the stencil slight to the bend slightly up and it causes a uh, uh, less amount of pace to be down. Now this is for the most part fine as long as you don't have a lot of parts in the same area and they're not really, really small apertures. If they're really, really small apertures that lift can sometimes not allow uh, a sufficient amount of paste to be applied. And you can see that on the bottom picture at the very right side. Um, there's that little teeny pad with just a little bit of solder. Um, it might be enough, but it might not. And those types of issues can cause a lot of issues down the line. Usually okay. ends up in uh, having to get a new stencil. So I have, okay, I've got two questions. Sorry, Shane, go ahead. Well, I, was, I, uh, I actually was, if saw a question in the chat and I was just going to bring that to um, Sebastian's attention real quick. The, um, the question was from uh, James, what is the average thickness of a stencil? Um, it, isn't it about three mil? Um, so uh, definitely, uh, it definitely changed. Like we see a lot of four to six mils is usually what we use okay. um, just because we like a little bit of more solder. Um, if we see a design that has a lot of high density, um, which is probably the ones that you're more familiar with, Shane, because customers are always asking about that. Uh, we can definitely go down to a smaller mill size. Three is pretty common if you have micro BGAs or a lot of O201s and stuff like that. Okay. And, and that's a great question, James. I appreciate you asking that. And, and, and one of the main reasons why we are having uh, this webinar today is to really share with you guys where we ended up on the technology that we use today. Um, which eliminates the need for guessing um, on the thickness of the stencil that we're going to need. Uh, with mixed technology, you know, we, we'd like for a three mil stencil to be on a part of the board, maybe a six mil somewhere else. Um, but that's a great question. And, um, and hopefully here in just a few moments when we show, share with you guys what we do now here at Advanced Assembly, um, we're going to show you why we've eliminated the um, the concern for how, how thick the particular stencil is. Absolutely. Um, all right, so we've made some improvements in stencil technology, right? People are still using them in production lines. You know, we're making a 100,000 boards. We're probably still gonna be using stencil. So can you tell us a little bit about how stencils, stencils have evolved? Yeah, and so stencil technology, like I said, is has been around for a very long time. So it's had a lot of opportunity to uh, to improve what's going on. And one of the biggest things that they have is uh, obviously you can change the stencil size in itself. That is a huge improvement. Um, the quality of the material is always getting better and better. Um, also, you can see there's this uh, coating on this top picture. Um, on the left side, you can see there's a droplet of water um, and it's very sticky and everything's kind of all over the place. Um, there's a lot of coatings now that are really good with uh, small apertures and everything, and it allows uh, for the paste to release better onto the board. Um, so the biggest thing with paste is obviously it's, uh, it's, it's all surface tension. Um, so if uh, you paste something and there's less surface tension for that uh, paste uh, on the board, it will want to stick to that board. Um, so if you have some hydrophobic uh, coating on your stencil, then uh, when you paste it, your paste is going to want to stick to that board more. And that's really what you want. You don't want your paste to stick uh, to your stencil because if that happens, then you have to repaste, re-clean everything, repaste the entire thing and cross your fingers again. Um, this is also another topic that Shane always likes to talk about too, is uh, 
Um, when you have issues like this, when you have, uh, when you paste something with a stencil, you have to clean those stencils periodically because that paste is gonna clog those apertures more and more and the drier that paste gets, the less likely it's gonna release perfectly. Um, so that's just another added uh, uh, labor and time uh, to a design. If you have you know, 100 boards that have to go through and you're washing a stencil every two to three boards, um, it's just extremely time intensive. I didn't even consider that. Thanks for sharing, Sebastian. Okay, yeah. so stencils, old and busted, new hotness, paste printers. Tell me all about them. Well, yeah, so one of, the, one of the other new technologies that is out here, um, obviously when you say paste printer, most people are still thinking about the automatic uh, stencil paste printer, um, which is just the automated one with the uh, electronically controlled arm. Uh, but they have these new ones called jet paste printers. Um, and basically what it is, it's like a dot matrix printer. It shoots uh, paste out at super high speeds and super small dots um, physically onto your board. This is a video of it kind of showing, it's a little choppy, but. Yeah, it's the uh, Zoom video. We're gonna blame them anyway, so. That. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be somebody's fault, right? <laughs> Or at least we have to blame someone. Of course. Um, and the really cool thing about uh, something like this is it's, it's all controlled by the software. There's no more uh, manual human element. Um, there's not someone who could be applying a different amount of pressure um, this time as opposed to the next time that they go and print it. Um, so the plus side with something like this is it's also 100% modifiable. If we see um, a particular location that needs to, needs to have more paste or needs to have less paste, we don't have to worry about being limited by the stencil thickness. Um, we can change that on the fly. We can do that almost immediately and uh, get a better uh, uh, first pass, if you will, uh, with, with our designs using this type of technology. All right. So, we go from our stencil, if I understand you guys correctly, with having all of these potential failure, uh, failure trees that, that, that can occur to solder paste cutting out the lion share of them. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah. Um, and I think there's, there's obviously still some limitations with the machine as well. And I, I can see a, a question actually in here. Um, David asks, can you apply solder with water soluble flux on a jet printer? Um, and you actually currently with the My600 uh, and their software, uh, they run through their own individual evaluation tests to make sure that all of the vacuum and the pressure and everything else um, on the machine is specifically going to allow for certain pace uh, to run efficiently. And there are not currently any water soluble fluxes uh, or pastes, so to speak, that are approved for uh, the My600. But they are working on it and I bug solder suppliers every time I see them uh, because those are the guys that are going to push for Micronic to get something uh, going for it. So hopefully soon, maybe this year, maybe next year, we can have something that can, that can work for that, uh, that kind of, those kinds of designs. All right, but then the water soluble, then I assume we still, we would order a stencil for if we yep. had to do a job. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. And that is, that is why we have our, uh, some of the stencil technology still available because some customers really cannot have no clean and that's perfectly fine. Uh, we can definitely still use the old tried and true stencil technology. All right. We've got a couple other questions. Uh, Mike says, what is the smallest paste dot it can place and how accurate is it? How accurate is this thing and how big are our typical paste dots? Yeah, so typical paste, I mean, uh, it really just depends. There are different nozzles for different things. Our specific machine can go down to a 0.3 millimeter uh, dot, and we can paste uh, micro BGAs with a pitch of uh, 0.3 millimeters as well. Um, so we've, we've been very successful with most micro BGAs. Um, we can paste 1005s, uh, 0201s, all of those super, super small parts uh, with very, very little issue um, and high repeatability, which is definitely an issue that uh, a lot of stencils um, are having. It's, it's very reliant on someone being very skilled and having that experience and doing it for years and years and years and knowing how to uh, 
properly design it and get it to paste well. And we x-ray those, you know, the 0.3 mil, I can't even imagine 0.3 millimeter HDI, you know, BGA. I don't want to design that, forget that. <laughs> but we x-ray those to prove it, right? Yeah, and so we actually have a, a kind of a specialized process for it in-house. We do what we call an internal first article where on every job that comes through, we will run the first board all the way through the process to our x-ray um, and adjust any of the, uh, the, the paste dots that we think need to be adjusted. Um, and we can do that live and on the go and it's not gonna affect the turn time. It's only gonna improve the, the quality and the repeatability of that board. And the board, it, I mean, the printer, it's all machine vision, right? It inspects this stuff as it's going along. That's part of the, the printing process, correct? That is correct, yes. It does have a uh, paste inspection as well, which is always a nice thing. It'll check to see if it missed a dot somewhere. Um, and you can turn that off and on however you choose. Um, we typically just handle it, it internally. Um, we also do a second check visually uh, because machines are great, but machines also can make failures. So, how fast does this thing go? I mean, how many pads? How do you measure the speed of these? Um, that's a really kind of difficult question to answer because uh, it really just depends on what kind of a design it is. If you have uh, like a huge thermal pad on it and that thermal pad requires a ton of paste to put down, it's going to take a while because it's putting those down dot by dot by dot. Um, but on your typical, your, your average, um, you know, uh, five inch by five inch board um, with decently high density, uh, it'll probably take a minute to a minute and a half per board. Okay. Um, we also had a question of how much does this thing cost? And I don't have an exact number for you, anonymous attendee, but let's just say if we had to choose between the printer and Sebastian, we keep the printer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mark, I'll add something in there that's kind of interesting and maybe, well, I don't even think we talk about it here, but you know, what, what happened when when we decided to go this route, and I maybe I want to share this really for the attendees because I want you to understand what some, what the process of going from a from the manual stencil process over to to this type of process, what it takes. So we knew that this product was out there, or, or excuse me, we knew that this product was being developed um, by the um, by the Micronic people, my data people. We knew it was out there. We'd heard about it for years and years. Uh, the problem is when 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 they developed it and the solder paste that they were um, preparing to to um, use with it, um, the no one had used this at um, at higher altitude. No one had used this um, in a in a drier climate, which we we have both here in in Colorado. And so uh, our initial uh, initial agreement with Micronic was let's get the let's get the machine here. Let's use it. Let's see if it does what you say it's going to do. Let's see if it works at, at high altitude. So we did, we, we did that and we brought it in. Um, we didn't pay a dime for it, but I brought it in. We were able to test it out, really working for them as, as a test facility. Um, what happened after that really is, was the game changer. What we realized was um, this process, along with a couple of things that we do here, um, we could virtually eliminate voiding um, um, little tiny microscopic bubbles that, that can occur in the solder paste. Um, but this, this uh, solder paste printer uh, reduced the voiding by such a great measure that, that it really got our attention. And, and it wasn't until we tested it out, we, we proved that it could work, we proved that the, the, the right solder paste to use at, at different elevations. Um, and then uh, the Micronic, that, that's when we went to Micronic and said, hey, well, since this piece of equipment's here already and you would have to pay to ship it, why don't you just give us a really good deal on it? Um, they gave us a decent deal on it. But, but Mark, I want to share is this, this piece of equipment was such a big game changer for us when it comes to the quality of the product that we're delivering. Uh, we within, and Sebastian, maybe you can remind me of this because I don't recall, but I think it was only about 10 months of using the first one that we decided this is a true game changer that we need to share with all of our customers. And that's when we decided to go out and actually procure, purchase the, the second one and almost eliminate the need for all stencils within our facility. 
Yeah, it was it was a little less than your. We're just like, nope, we need to get a second one. We have six machines to run. Um, we got to increase the amount that we can pump through it and decrease the amount going through stencils. That's pretty interesting. That's pretty amazing. All right, I see Sebastian, you've also picked up a reliability question. I'd like to chime in on that too, but go ahead and, uh, go ahead and take first crack. Yeah, and so... Um, I don't really have any guidelines because it really just depends on what kind of the application is. For example, like we Let's, have... Uh, let me read the question real quick first. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good sure. idea. Uh, it says, considering reliability guidelines, shock and vibe based simulation test on the board, are there any guidelines or thickness of solder that should be used based on size or types of pad? Yeah, and so um, that's really, really hard to say. Oftentimes, uh, like as far as guidelines go, um, it's it's really hard to say, but it really just depends on what kind of application. If you're looking at something that's going, you know, down into a hole somewhere and it's going to be sitting next to a motor or something like that. Um, if you have uh, something that is going to require a higher amount of pace, I would always suggest adding something on your drawing, your assembly drawing to make sure that your assembly house can proper properly capture that. And honestly, I would, I would put most of that uh, into their hands to kind of decide because they see all these different designs every day and they have an idea of uh, what typically works best for what type of industry it is. Um, if it's something that's going into a car, um, you could always look at other options. Um, for example, uh, like conductive epoxy applications instead of using solder paste. Um, it should also be noted lead-free pastes are more brittle um, than uh, leaded paste. So if you don't have a Rojas requirement, it may be better to go with an option like that. Um, and then it, once again, if you have something that just needs to have a really robust connection, I would throw that on the assembly drawing and let your assembler know, hey, I've got this critical part. I want as much uh, mechanical strength or whatever on this, and they can do whatever they can uh, to help improve that, whether it's adding some sort of staking or increasing the amount of paste or something like that, um, that matches what they do. So you're not increasing the amount of cost for something that, that someone already has a really good solution for. All right, I'd like to add on to that. Uh, if you go to IPCJ standard 001, I think currently in revision E, it'll give you um, basically the assembly criteria, how high the solder, um, you know, fillet's going to go up, go up the part. And then you move over to IPC, oh gosh, I want to say it's 2351. I could be remembering that wrong. It's just off the top of my head. Currently in revision B, it's really only, only a suggestion for pad sizes. Uh, and you might be familiar with, you know, the least nominal, you know, most pad size. You're going to want to go with the option that gives you the largest pad because that's going to allow the fillet to go further up the part. Now, you go over into those recommendations for it and they're really kind of only approximations. The, um, you know, they'll take like an 0805 capacitor. If I go over to DigiKey, I'm going to go find, I want to say, you know, 20 to 30 different you know, multi-layer ceramic chip capacitor heights, but they're all using the exact same footprint. Well, if you're using thicker parts, you can have bigger pads, taller fillets, which are going to give you, uh, you know, supposedly a higher reliability. But then you have to go in there and you have to manually tweak each part. So to answer your question, you know, will you get greater reliability if you increase your pad size? Yeah, probably, but it's a lot of time and trouble. So you have to really make sure that the time investment is worth the increase in, rel in reliability on that. And that might involve designing custom pads, which is a bit of a pain. Um, I want to say pcblibraries.com has a custom pad calculator that you could use to do that without you know, pulling out the old slide rule and, and going that route. But is it worth it? I don't know. You might be better off just assembling it like you would any old board and staking the parts that you're worried about. Um, anything else you want to add, Shane or Sebastian? No, I think, I think that about hits it on the net for me. Okay. All right. Um, let's, let's finish. Questions popping up. Yeah, well, we've got time for questions, but we've got one, let's just finish our one last slide and then we're into the question section anyway. So why do we like the solder paste printer over stencils? I think we've covered that pretty thoroughly, but is there anything else you guys want to throw on there? 
Um, I mean, I'll, I'll throw some on there. I, I think the biggest thing uh, more than anything else in the world is uh, with all of it being software controlled and electronic and everything else like that is just the improved repeatability. Um, if you cannot repeat um, the same success you had previously, then uh, because whoever pasted it originally with a stencil decided to, I don't know, break their hand that weekend, um, then you're just setting yourself up for failure in the future, uh, just in the long end. It's just going to reduce the manufacturability. But with this uh, paste printer, it just makes it that much easier to make something more repeatable and more easily available for any paste operator instead of just one particular one. All right. Well, with that, let's let's jump into the questions. Uh, and we've got plenty of them. Are there any that you want to start with, Sebastian or Shane? Uh, let's see. Um, we've got a couple of questions here about can the uh, solder paste printer be used for pinned or through hole parts? Um, and, and the questions came in in a couple of varying degrees, but but I'll just answer the question. Um, I'll, I'll answer the, both of these questions um, together. They came from, uh, let's see, Jacob and um, Amba. And, and what I'll say there is um, we do know of some capabilities with the solder paste printer where you, you can build up um, paste in some areas um, for pin parts. We don't do it. And, and, and I'll tell you why. It's the main reason we don't do it. If, so if, you, if you know about advanced assembly, um, advanced assembly was built from the ground up. I and mean, when we created our company, we built our company for, for speed to be the fastest PCB assembly company in the U.S. That being said, um, I would also note we ship out about the probably 30 unique designs every single day. So for us, um, for us, this piece of equipment came um, to, yes, it gives us the ability to move faster than ever before with greater quality than ever before and more and a higher reliability. So there are a, there's a few creative uh, ways that we've been told that you can use the paste printer. Uh, but for us here, we, we try to stick just to the SMT components to make sure that those pieces have the solder placed, uh, appropriate solder placed, placed on the board um, and, and, and then moving down, those, moving down the line as quickly as possible. Um, so we stick to the SMT components here at AA. All right. Thanks, Shane. Uh, I'll take one from Chris. It says, uh, how does the jet speed compare to the stencil printing speed? So our focus is on, you know, low to mid volume, uh, quick turn, ultra, I mean, crazy quick turn. We can take a board and stuff it within, you know, six hours of receiving your design files and your credit card. That includes, you know, you know, procuring parts. We're one of DigiKeys, Mousers, Arrow's largest customers. We've got teams of the pull stuff force. We're fast. So for the low volume uh, type thing, we can get your board stuffed and out the door before your stencil would ever even make it to us. That being said, if you're moving into the high volume, uh, you know, maybe you're going somewhere offshore, uh, you're probably still gonna be using stencils because the stencils are king. You know, there's, the graphs intersect at some point, you know? Um, so at some point, you know, you're doing 100,000 boards, you're doing a million boards. Yeah, you're probably not going to be putting them all through paste printers. Uh, well, does that sound about accurate to you guys? Yeah, and I think the most important thing with that is, uh, I mean, yes, uh, stencils can be quicker because you can literally put a board in and swipe it over and it's good to go. But how repeatable is that process? How consistent is the result that you're getting? One paster uh, compared to every other paster is going to be almost completely different depending on who's doing it. Um, and the automatic stencils uh, help alleviate that, but it's almost the same thing as the jet paste printer. It is still slower than the manual process. So the real question is, is one, how consistent do you want your results or how quick do you want your results? Um, it's really just dependent on design. It takes us what, two days to get a stencil in? Somewhere yep. around there? Correct. So if there's a stencil and then there's a redesign, that's four days. Okay, that's great. We can have your order done in eight hours you know, there's not even time to get the stencil manufactured uh, before we can have that thing through our paste printer. It just depends on volume. So yep. hopefully that answers Chris. All right, who wants the next one? Uh, uh, what call it out, Mark. I am, um, there's so many, there's so many of them. So if you, I sure. know, I'll see if I okay. can get my name. I've got something. one that I know Sebastian is gonna jump on from Rob. All right, 
does it help avoid voiding under QFP packages? So when we, I, I, QFP package by itself, Rob, um, doesn't have a thermal pad, but I'm gonna adjust your question because I'm pretty sure that's what you're talking about. Um, does, it, does this printer do anything for us regarding voids underneath packages? Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of the same thing um, with the paste printer. Um, the paste and everything else is in a syringe. So it's in a very closed environment. So you don't have to worry about uh, exposure to uh, the environment as much versus like water soluble where uh, the longer it's out and waiting for it to be to, to paste, uh, it's gonna absorb moisture and other things from the air. Um, so uh, typically no clean paste uh, does reduce the amount of voiding, which is what is required to be used on the My600. So in short, yes it does, but not necessarily just because of the machine itself. It's more of the type of paste that, that is approved for it. Um, the bigger thing I think for reducing voiding on um, your paste, uh, just in general, is uh, how your paste file is set up. Um, so there's different types of methods and everything else, uh, like five die or window painting, um, where you are specifically defining what sections of a large thermal pad get paste on it um, to allow for areas uh, of the moisture or any sort of other environmental contaminants to outgas during the reflow process. Um, so there's a lot of methods in how it's pasted uh, that affect voiding a lot more than uh, the machine itself or with a, a manual process. Yeah, and uh, you want to try to avoid having vias underneath your thermal pads. Um, oh yeah, that too. Yeah, I mean, I was always taught as a designer, you know, use the thermal pads to connect your, you know, your top or your bottom layer into your ground planes. Um, but you can create so much voiding if you do that improperly that, you know, there's air gaps under there that completely negate the point of even having a, a via that's connecting to your ground plane in there. Sebastian, you want to, uh, I know that's your, probably the largest pet peeve in your life. Do you want to discuss that at all? What yeah, do I don't know how I missed that on that question. You, you totally just blew my mind right there. But yes, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's kind of the same thing. There, there are ways to get around it. Um, but obviously, if you have a via and it's not capped or anything like that, um, during the reflow process, air and everything else, when it heats up, it rises. Um, and what will happen is that will come up through that via and it will create a large void in your thermal pad. And that's one of the biggest causes for rework um, for a lot of new designers, um, just because they're, they're not aware of these types of things. And honestly, there's, there's so many different variables that go into the assembly process. There's really no way that they would, uh, but that's always something to, to, to keep an eye out for, um, especially on like a BGA or uh, something like that, that can be uh, almost kill a design immediately. Um, just because it's not reworkable because no matter how many times you try replacing that, you're always going to have that air come up or that solder go down through that via. Um, so my, my end point to that whole thing is always cap your vias. Yep. All right. Uh, we've got a question. What are your recommendations on fab quality control, uh, quality assurance? So every part that we can see, where, you know, the pin, the pad connection, we're going to inspect with uh, some sort of automatic optical inspection and also follow that up with a person looking at things. Anything that we can't see goes through a really fancy five axis 3D x-ray. Every board we build, if there are pads or lands that are invisible to the human eye, uh, every single one of those gets 3D x-rayed for quality control. And that's in-house. We don't have to send that out to anywhere. So if if you want quick turn and you want quality, you need an x-ray for anything that can't be seen on um, optical or visual inspection. All right, who wants the next one? Shane, yeah, I saw you tagged a couple. Yeah, Mark, I'll add to that answer you just said. One of the things that a lot of our customers don't understand or don't, don't know is that um, most of the time we will actually, you order 10 boards, we'll, we'll just, we'll paste them. We'll only place parts on one. Um, we'll, we'll QA it. We'll run it through reflow. We'll QA it again. Um, that's kind of an, our internal first article. Um, we're going to make sure that, that everything is adding up before we run the remainder of your build. Saves our customers uh, a lot of money um, in case there's something that in that design that we didn't, an issue in that design that we didn't find. Um, but that's just a, a service that we offer. It's, 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 just, it's included. 
Um, and, and the customer generally would never even know that it happens because it all happens behind the scene. I just wanted to add that with what you had already mentioned is something that really makes the, our approach with the Pace printer, it speeds us up so much that we're able to, to offer that service um, during the process. All right, thanks Shane. Uh, Sebastian, do you have any, or Shane, do you wanna pick one? Yeah, I've got yeah, I, got one. Oh. I got I got one here that's actually um, I put my name on it, but I'm actually going to read it and I'm going to let Sebastian answer it because it's uh, <laughs> it's 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 one that we we talk about a lot here. Um, and this one is um, really it goes into you, you know have we talked about this a little bit earlier when when you need more solder on on, on one area of a board um, because of a component uh, versus less on another. But the question came from Para and I'll read it, um, Sebastian, you see it, but something we love, I, I'll, I'd like to respond a little bit too, but can this machine dynamically adjust the thickness of paste on the same circuit board? E even more, can it do two different paste thicknesses on the same pad? Um, on QFN leadless packages that require uh, side flank wetting rather than over printing paste. Um, thick paste on the side of the chip would allow for a better solder uh, fillet. So Sebastian, you, what do you, what do you want to say about that? Yeah, so I actually love this question because it's something that we're trying to dive more into. Once again, th this paste printer is relatively new to the industry. So there's not a lot of uh, reading material or research or a lot of other stuff. A lot of stuff that we're doing on how to improve um, how we use this machine is completely done in-house and we, we do our own tests and we do all these different things. And I love this question because it talks about one of the things that uh, I actually plan on moving towards here in a month or two. And that's um, like castellated terminals, uh, for instance, with uh, bottom termination connections as well. Oftentimes, castellated terminals have a pad underneath the part that connects to the board um, in addition to the castellation. Um, with a stencil, you can throw paste down and you can hope that there's the, going to be some sort of vertical wetting up the castellation, but oftentimes you don't get that. You only get 25 to 30 percent, depending on how much paste you put down. But one of the things that we can do with our uh, stencil or our paste printer, sorry, not our stencil, um, is we can add uh, as many pads to uh, or dots or whatever you want to call it to whatever location that we we choose. So we can 100 percent um, adjust the thickness of each and individual uh, paste um, paste dot, so to speak. Uh, so if we have a castellated, we can have less paste on the bottom termination connection, and we can put more on the outside where that castellation is to help improve uh, the wetting. And that's that's something you can kind of see in uh, the stencil process with step stencils, and it, it kind of works, but in all honesty, it, it doesn't do it anything like what we can possibly do with the, the My 600. And I'll add on to that. Um, all you're really doing is staging extra paste for the reflow process, but once that actually melts, well, you know, once it changes phase, um, what's going to control where that, that solder ends up is the surface tension of the flux, the surface tension of the solder metals, and the surface geometry of your base materials, your, you know, your basically your metallized parts. And Sebastian was using the example of the, uh, the castellation uh, versus the land pad. All of those geometries and the surface tension of the liquid metal when it's wet, that's going to affect what it looks like once it changes phase back to the solid phase. Um, we're just staging it with the solder paste printer. I don't know if that made sense. I don't feel like I can explain that well. All right, uh, what's next? So I was going to add onto that and then I've got the next question here, but one of the, um, we had a customer a few years ago uh, that every uh, every every order that they placed with us came with, with special notes and one of the notes was uh, well, actually, sorry, uh, we the customer was visiting, and he and if and if he's on the uh, on on this webinar, that would be awesome. But he was visiting us, and he said, you know, I love working with you guys. The quality's great, blah blah blah. But 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 the issue he had was he's got some parts on the board that have a lot of a lot of heat um, that that uh, that just process a lot of heat. And one of the questions was, you know, is there any way that I could could show you where I need extra solder um, added? to the board after assembly. And, um, and we did that. Well, um, with, with the paste printer, we, act, we were able to just program that in. 
And, and so, you know, we, we add 15% to that particular pad. So um, it really allowed um, that customer um, the ability, what, what, what Sebastian said earlier, for repeatability so that he would get the same result every time instead of having three or four people back there adding solder to parts and, and that, that um, the extra solder would be different from one to the next board. Um, and now we're able to do that across the board. So it gives us um, gives us um, amazing flexibility. Um, yeah. I, wa I wanted to read, uh, I, actually I wanted, I've got a question here from um, a statement from Mike. And Mike says, this is a game changer, save money on stencils, quality improvement, footprint savings, storage of stencils, uh, on and on and on. Um, wow, can we send you a brochure? And um, I would say, Mike, if you're still on, um, I think I've got your email address, but just in case I don't, send me an email, Shane, S-H-A-N-E at AAPCB.com. And, um, and I'll get some more information over to you. But um, yes, 100% what you, your statement, um, really, it really solidifies why we made this choice and, um, and why we went back and got a second one. And I'd love to share as, as many details about it, answer as many um, uh, side questions as you might have about that. Uh, Sebastian, we've got three questions from uh, two different mics, uh, and I think you might be best equipped to answer those. We got a lot of mics here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so let's see. First one is also what is the volume per hour of one of these? I know it depends on the PCB land count. Um, so yeah, it's very design dependent, um, but to kind of put it in perspective, we have two machines um, typically only running about 60% of the time and we process 20 different designs in a day ranging from quantity five to 50. Um, so if you have, uh, let's say a thousand boards with, let's say 20 different pads, which is a really small board, um, relatively quick, it would take, um, if it's panelized, probably about three minutes total to, to paste all those um, versus uh, like one board with well over a thousand SMT, um, you're probably looking at closer to like 15 minutes. Um, Per, per board just to, to paste all the way through. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, and we kind of touched on it earlier, stencils can be quicker, but not having to wait for another stencil, being able to change it immediately um, and still not losing a crazy amount of cycle time to print one board, um, we can print a lot of these very quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, do you think you can answer the other uh, the, regarding powder, uh, the, the yeah. type sizes? Cool. Yeah, so what powder type size is the smallest for stencil versus jet? Um, so obviously stencil um, can go down to seven. Um, I think there's actually even smaller sizes than that, uh, but people don't really use it. The most common small size you see is probably six. Uh, the My 600 can go down to a, uh, I believe type five, and the My 700 can go up to a Type 6. Um, and one of the smaller nozzles that you can get can actually print dots as small as 0.2 millimeters, um, which is, once again, really small. It's a third smaller than the dot size than we can currently print. Um, but we've kind of gotten our processes down so much on our side that uh, it's really not something, an upgrade we're really looking for at this current moment. Uh, but I hope that kind of answers it. Um, the other thing too is a lot of the uh, the type of pace was, uh, I mean, all of that technology was made because of stencil design. So you need smaller uh, solder balls in order to uh, properly paste on a stencil uh, versus the jet printer where you have less of a risk for that. Um, obviously, if your solder fits through the nozzle, then you're pretty much able to go as, as small as, uh, as the nozzle can. All right, thank you. Um, so we'll clear that one and we're almost done here. How often do you have to clean the, you guys clean that daily, don't you? Just well, you in don't, the shift? This is, this is why, you know, with, with this, this question was, um, I really like this question. Um, I'll start because it's, um, it, it, it's a hot button for me and Sebastian, if you want to add anything in, please do. <laughs> But, you know, what got us to this point was as components got so small, um, we were 
to, to, to give you repeatability and reliability, we have to take your stencils and, and wash them at almost every time that we, that we paste. Um, most companies won't do it, don't do it. They don't have time to, uh, they just don't have the, the manpower to. With the paste printer, because we're, we're basically using a syringe to, to uh, uh, this, we order the syringe full of paste um, and it, it, it uh, places the, the soldered paste dot on the board. Um, there's really there's really no cleaning required. We we go until the solder paste syringe is empty and we put a new one on. The only paste that's that that comes out of the syringe is to go directly onto your board. So we can pop off the leaded um, the leaded syringes, put on lead free, and we're right back to moving forward. So what this does it it eliminates the need where you, with stencils you have to clean. Uh, it eliminates that because we we no longer have to clean anything because we just go into the syringe um, to the system lets us know a syringe needs to be replaced. Um, and, and then we put a new syringe and, and we're, we're off to the races. Um, Sebastian, you want to add anything to that? Isn't that, that's pretty much it though, I believe. So there, there is a, they call it a filter, but it's not really a filter. It's like a, an overflow. Um, uh, I don't know, an overflow, not bucket, but it's like a little teeny uh, piece that we swap out uh, once a shift. Um, and that's basically the closest thing you have to cleaning and basically, uh, all it does is just remove any of the excess paste in between. So you're not getting any sort of stringing, um, which is less so because once again, the, the paste viscosity doesn't really allow for a whole lot of it, but it does have that little piece there to help reduce some of that. Uh, but that's about it. And those are like, they're like a buck a piece. They're super, super easy to swap out. Takes less than mm, five seconds to do. Um, that's the closest thing you get to cleaning. All right, let's go ahead and uh, wrap this up. We are at the hour mark. Um, anonymous attendee, you're quite, you've got a question here that looks more like a quote. To answer your question, yes, we can do all of that. Please email shane at aapcb.com or sales at aapcb.com, and we can follow up on that for you. And then Mike asks a question, is the paste uh, jet better for power powder size, less oxygen exposure, higher flux contents, anything like that or something else. So does this type of solder paste prevail over stencil solder paste? Uh, I don't know that it significantly does. It's just designed differently for this spray application. I mean, this solder paste printer, you know, has accelerations of like 3G. You know, it, it is launching these little solder balls as projectiles and, you know, they're flying down as it's moving on to the next pad. This is crazy fast. It's just designed for a different application. Um, so with that, I would like very much to thank everybody for their time. Shane and Sebastian, I know you, you want to get back to work. These are their emails. You can contact them directly, and I highly recommend that you do if you have any questions. Uh, even if they can't answer them, they're going to get, get you to the, right, to the right person. Next week in our Taught Teach Tech Thursday series, we've got the Gracia brothers with uh, design tips and cost-saving tricks. Two of uh, Royal Circuit's most favorite employees are going to teach us everything you need to know about saving money on your next design. With that, uh, Shane and Sebastian, guys, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mark. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Sebastian. And uh, for our customers um, and, and engineers that decided to join us today, thank you for your time. Uh, means the world to us. So, so thank you for being a, a part of our our webinar today. Yeah, you want to, before we go, do you want to tell people about the uh, competition you're kicking off today? Yeah, yeah the, the bag of swag. <laughs> so, so, hey guys, the last few of you think about 60, some odd of you are still here. So we know with the COVID um, situation that everybody is kind of found a unique way to to still get the job done. And, um, and obviously you guys are here listening, so that means a lot to us. But um, we, uh, we, just, we had a couple of our uh, customers send us a picture of their, their current setup um, at their homes. And we thought it would be uh, it, it, very entertaining, by the way, but we thought it would be a fun, a fun little challenge to, to roll out to our customers. Send us a picture of your at-home workspace and um, we're gonna take the most entertaining ones and we're gonna be sending a bag of swag, advanced assembly swag out. Um, we've got backpacks and bags and, and hoodies and jackets and, and, and um, um, hydro flask, a lot of really cool stuff. So share with us how you're able to continue to get the job done while working from home um, during these crazy times. And who knows, maybe we'll throw you a little, little bag of swag in the mail and, um, and, and share some gifts with you. So, 
So send those over to sales at aapcb.com. Um, and, uh, and let's see if, uh, if we can um, pick a winner from you guys. Hey, they're all winners to me, Shane. Shane and Sebastian, thank you so much. We'll see you all next Thursday, same time. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone.